This after school presentation was written and recorded by Eternalized. The one essential condition of human existence is that man should always be able to bow down before something infinitely great. If men are deprived of the infinitely great, they will not go on living and will die of despair. The 19th century Russian novelist Fyodor Dostoevsky is considered as one of the greatest writers in the world. His work explores existential and psychological issues with theology. This interplay between the human and the divine allows us to get to the depth of the human condition. It is a testament to his genius that his work is still widely read and discussed today, for it expresses fundamental and timeless concerns of the human being. Dostoevsky had studied engineering, but his passion for literature made him resign from the career he was trained for and devoted himself to writing, despite remaining in great financial difficulty. He became part of a group of revolutionaries and was eventually arrested, finding himself incarcerated and in solitary confinement. This was, however, the true beginning of his inner life. From the deepest darkness, he found the light with which he later wrote his greatest works. He was led to be shot by a firing squad, but at the very last minute, a messenger arrived waving a white flag. It had been a mock execution, a twisted form of psychological torture. Afterwards, he was sent to a prison labor camp in Siberia in extremely harsh conditions. In his book, The Idiot, Dostoevsky sets himself to depict a good soul in a cruel world and describes the thoughts of a person before execution, mirroring his own experience. It seemed that he had only five more minutes to live, and said that those minutes were like an eternity. He calculated the exact time he needed to take leave of his companions, and decided that he could do that in two minutes. Then he spent another two minutes thinking over his life, and another minute for a last look around. There was a church not far off. Its gilded spire shone in the bright sunshine. He remembered staring with awful intensity at it, and the rays of light sparkling from it. He could not tear his eyes from those rays of light. They seemed to him to be his new nature, and he felt he had somehow merged with them. The feeling of disgust with what must ensue almost immediately, and the uncertainty, were dreadful. But he said that the thing that was most horrible to him was the constant thought, what if I had not to die? What if I were to return to life again? Oh, what an eternity of days, and all mine. I should count every minute separately and waste none. He said that this reflection finally filled him with such bitterness that he wished to be shot as quickly as possible. To understand Dostoevsky's works, we should know that he wrote in a time of increasing atheism, nihilism, utilitarianism, materialism, and what would later become communism. Man's ego became the center of the world, and the goal was the maximization of happiness through a calculated and rational approach. Moreover, technological progress would guide man to attain a utopia and finally be happy. However, the exact opposite happened. These ideas were partly the result of the bloodshed of the 20th century. The totalitarian states took over people's freedom and justified murdering all dissenters in the name of progress. Man is a strange animal. He wants to be happy, but ends up being miserable. He likes to count his troubles, but does not count his happiness. Happiness cannot be pursued. It must ensue. Seeking happiness solely through money material acquisition, power or fame, only gives us a temporary sense of happiness. After covering our basic needs, we must proceed to the task of self-realization and self-transcendence, or else we will feel stagnated and empty. There's no satiation point for a spiritual longing by physical means. By losing touch with our soul, the essence of our being, and to our spiritual relationship with a higher self, we become neurotic and split. In Crime and Punishment, Dostoevsky portrays the results of this inner split through the character Raskolnikov, whose name literally means split or schism. Dostoevsky uses this character 
as a mouthpiece for the ideals espoused by the society of his time. For Raskolnikov, God is dead, and in order to fill the void, he must become God himself. One cannot help but to notice the similarities between Raskolnikov and Nietzsche's tragic declaration of the death of God, a historical event that inevitably would lead to nihilism, and God had to be replaced by the man-god, or Übermensch, who would conquer nihilism through sheer willpower. Raskolnikov writes a paper on how extraordinary men can trespass the accepted moral standards for the common good with a clean conscience, while ordinary men blindly follow societal norms and conventions like sheep. Raskolnikov sees an opportunity to put his ideals into practice, after overhearing people talk in a tavern about a wicked and greedy old woman who works as a pawnbroker and takes advantage of everyone, he decides to murder her, because in the utilitarian approach, society would be better off without her, as she is a louse, and her money could be used to help his family and to pay for his studies, in order to become a lawyer and perform good deeds for society. Raskolnikov carefully plans the murder and kills her with an axe, but while looking for her money and goods, her half-sister unexpectedly walks in, so he quickly kills her too. Here, Dostoevsky brilliantly portrays the psychology of a murderer. Raskolnikov, as planned, kills the wicked old woman, but also a totally innocent human being who was in the wrong place at the wrong time. At the very moment of committing the murder, Raskolnikov also killed a part of himself. He was not the extraordinary man he believed himself to be. Instead, he is tormented by his own conscience, and his guilt overwhelms him to the point of psychosomatic illness. The book does not so much explore the legal consequences of crime, but rather what happens to a person after trespassing the moral boundary. In fact, the original Russian title of the book connotes a stepping across, as is the religious implication of transgression. Sometimes one lacks knowledge and thus cannot make the right choices. Other times, however, one knows the right thing but still doesn't make the right choices. This is an age-old problem, and is the result of a conflict between intellect and will, what we know and what we choose. It is likely that we have all experienced something that appeared to be good, but was in fact bad. Therefore, we must learn to use the intellect as a basis for making good choices and to discipline our will. We want to be healthy, but are unhealthy. We are addicted to something destructive but cannot get ourselves out of it. We believe in love, but rarely express it to others, etc. This cognitive dissonance further results in an inner split. Raskolnikov knows what he did was wicked, but does his best to avoid the consequences of his crime, which results in him slowly descending into madness, suggesting that if we find ourselves in such a situation, it is better to confess and face whatever one has to face. Eventually, Raskolnikov confesses to his crimes and is sent to prison. Interestingly, this is when he goes through a spiritual journey, the only way he can deal with his mental anguish and be redeemed. But it is not clear that he ultimately attains spiritual freedom, for his ego is still at play, and considers what he did not as a sin, but simply an error. The word religion comes from religare which literally means to put things back together again. In order to reunite our fragmented inner self, we must undergo a complete transformation of our entire being, which can only be attained with a relationship to a higher self, with God. This is the job of the religious life. Paradoxically, we can only become ourself by surrendering to a higher self. Ecstasy is to stand outside oneself without ceasing to be oneself. After his serious illness, Raskolnikov has a dream of a virus that causes its victims to think that they are the sole possessors of truth. There is no objectivity. Everything becomes subjective. However, this does not lead to freedom. Instead, people try to impose their views on others, and no one gets along, so they tear themselves apart. Without religion to provide an objective view of morality, and rival authoritarianism, it is the strongers who finally impose their view on everyone. Without God, everything is permitted.
This is an allegory of the dangerous ideas that Dostoevsky witnessed in his time that caused millions of deaths, which he brilliantly prophesied. In Notes from Underground, Dostoevsky portrays one of the darkest and least sympathetic of all his characters, the nameless protagonist simply known as the Underground Man. And though it is a fictitious character, Dostoevsky states that he not only may, but must exist as a product of the ideologies of his time. The Underground Man is a bitter, spiteful, and self-hating retired 40-year-old civil servant, who was rude and intimidating towards his customers, though it was all part of a game. As he admits, he could never be genuinely wicked. He describes listening to others through the cracks under the floor, as if he were a mouse. His inability to interact with other people causes his attempts to form relationships and participate in life to end in disaster, driving him deeper underground, until he is completely locked away from the world. The underground man distracts himself by reading novels, but is disappointed by the real world, representing his profound alienation from society. I am a sick man. I am a spiteful man. I am an unattractive man. I believe my liver is diseased. No, I refuse to consult a doctor from spite. That you probably will not understand. My liver is bad. Well, let it get worse. These are the words of the underground man, which introduces us to his psychological distress right from the beginning. He is unable to properly define himself and constantly revises what he says as he's nothing more than a chaos of conflicting emotional impulses. Just like Raskolnikov, he experiences an inner split. The underground man is very envious of the so-called man of action, for whom ignorance is bliss, and simply goes about his day living without ruminating too much on life. But the underground man finds solace in his intellectual superiority. Nevertheless, he is constantly paralyzed by his thoughts and cannot act. He is a man of acute consciousness, stuck in his own reflective hyperconsciousness. Thinking too much is a disease, and since he cannot choose, he is characterless and has no identity. He writes, I did not know how to become anything, neither spiteful nor kind, neither a rascal nor an honest man, neither a hero nor an insect. Out of pure boredom, the underground man has given birth to his self-created hell out of his own internal ruminations which led him to write his notes. Man is by no means a rational animal, but innately irrational and destructive, and it is not reason that saves him from his impulses and desires, but rather faith. The underground man says that the best definition of man is the ungrateful biped. He would sacrifice all his advantages just to choose for himself, even if it were happiness, wealth, health or security, in order to preserve his individuality. Shower upon man every earthly blessing, drown him in a sea of happiness, so that nothing but bubbles of bliss can be seen on the surface. Give him economic prosperity, such that he should have nothing else to do but sleep, eat cakes, and busy himself with the continuation of his species, and even out of sheer ingratitude, sheer spite. Man would play you some nasty trick, simply in order to prove to himself, as though that were so necessary, that men still are men and not the keys of a piano. Life is not a mathematical formula or problem to be solved, but a reality to be experienced. If we could access the perfect formula for happiness, so that everything would be so clearly calculated and explained that choices would cease to exist, we would act against reason in order to prove our free will. This is our deep craving for self-expression. Man loves to create and build, but also loves chaos and destruction. Perhaps it is because he is instinctively afraid of attaining his goal and only loves looking at it from a distance. He loves building it, but does not want to live in it. We will never renounce to destruction nor suffering. Thinking about a world without suffering will only sink us further into suffering, for happiness cannot exist without suffering. It is our capacity to endure suffering that makes us truly great. 
For years, the underground man would desire revenge over any small injury and remember it down to the smallest details, and every time would add even more details, teasing and tormenting himself with his own imagination. He admits that he invents adventures for himself, for he really has nothing else to do with his life. Many times, he even takes offense simply on purpose, though he knows that he's offended at nothing, but convinces himself at last to the point of being really offended. He continuously lies to himself so that he cannot even distinguish it from truth, and loses all respect for himself and others, and having no respect, he ceases to love. In the end, he destroys and betrays himself for nothing. Nothing in the world is harder than speaking the truth, and nothing easier than flattery. The underground man ends his notes by stating, as far as I myself am concerned, I have merely carried to an extreme in my life what you have not dared to carry even halfway, and, what's more, you have taken your cowardice for good sense, and found comfort in thus deceiving yourselves, so that, perhaps, after all, there is more life in me than in you. It is interesting that Dostoevsky, though an orthodox Christian, usually has his main characters espousing the opposite of his own views of life. He does not criticize his opponents, but gives strong and reasonable arguments for them, to the point that we can even relate to them and develop sympathy with them. Rather than telling us what to do, Dostoevsky paints the psychological hell that we sometimes send ourselves into. His work allows us to explore ourselves through the characters portrayed, where we may see a reflection of our own life experiences. We learn from Dostoevsky that we should always put our own existential condition first, and not the ideas others tell us to believe in, to adjust our life views as we ourselves experience life, to beware of utopias that seduce us and leads us astray, to see life as a polarity and suffering as a necessary complement to happiness, and to focus on what truly matters in the end, our relationship with our deepest self and God, without which there's no salvation at all. I hope you found this collaboration valuable. If you're interested in learning more about the works of Dostoevsky and other prominent thinkers, head over to my channel, Eternalized. Thank you for watching.